Good morning. Good morning. Happy Feast of the Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> today our gospel talks about Jesus healing, among other things. So today we're going to look at how God heals in the sermon. And then secondly, our midweek Lenten services kick off with Ash Wednesday in just a week and a half. 
So our first Lenten service, Ash Wednesday, will be February 17th. Now this year, again, because of COVID, we're not gonna have the meals beforehand, so it's just the services. So go ahead and put that on your calendar. With that said, let's go ahead and begin our worship service this morning with our first hymn. And may God bless our worship of him on this beautiful day. I invite you to stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Bible says in Isaiah and in the Psalms, Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. O oh God, you have come to call us to repentance and faith, to salvation and life. We come before you to confess and repent of our sins. Lord, have mercy. For the times we have failed to keep our faith, for the times we have tried to keep our faith a private concern, failing to be all things to all people for the sake of your kingdom, instead seeking your blessings only for ourselves. Lord, have mercy. For the times we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves and have neglected prayer and concern for the community in need around us and for people throughout the world. 
Lord, have mercy for the many faults and failings that are known only to you. Lord, have mercy. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And let us pray together. O Lord, keep your family, the church, continually in the true faith that relying on the hope of your heavenly grace we may ever be defended by your mighty power through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated. The epistle is from the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast. Since I am compelled to preach, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel if, if I preach voluntarily. I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the, the trust committed to me. When then is my reward? Just this that in preaching the gospel I may offer it free of charge and do not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I became all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that I may, so after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went into, with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. 
This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. I invite you to bow your heads for prayer. Almighty God, we ask for your blessing this day as we look to the life of Jesus during his three years of public ministry here on earth. In his visible presence, he healed people. Let us see his active ministry of healing us today in three very specific ways and to gain appreciation of the mysteries of God and how you work in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible teaches that God heals us in three different ways. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually. In today's gospel, we read about a physical healing in the house of the mother-in-law of the apostle Peter. After Jesus healed her. The Bible says a whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. So it wasn't just one person that was healed, it was many. And you imagine the front lawn of your house filled with sick people wanting to see the guest you were having inside your house. But that's exactly how the scene unfolded in today's gospel. Healing people physically, emotionally, and spiritually is one of the things that Jesus emphasized the most in his ministry. Jesus gave his disciples the authority to heal as well. In Matthew 10, 7 through 8, we hear these words. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons. Throughout the New Testament, throughout the documents of the early church, even the history of the Lutheran Church, healing was and still is an important ministry of Christ's church on earth. It is a gift that God gives us purely out of his grace and mercy because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. But when we start talking about healing in the Christian church, some people will have a negative reaction. And I think it's for one of three different reasons. First, God heals some people. There's no mistaking about that. They just get better. And it's not because of modern medicine. It's because of God's supernatural work. But there's others for whom we pray for, and they continue to live with their diseases or their chronic conditions. 
and sometimes they succumb to them. We don't know the mysteries of God or his unrevealed will. And that troubles us because we wonder why some and not others. But we have to trust in God's good and gracious will for each one of us. Second reason why I think some people are uncomfortable talking about healing in the church is the great damage that TV evangelists have done who've taken a gift of God and exploited it for their own glory or greed or to be in control of others. Finally, healing can be a perplexing topic to study in the Bible. Those of you who have read the New Testament many times might recall that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, that the great deceiver, Satan, leading up to Jesus Christ's second coming, will try to dupe people into believing that he too can heal. But none of these three reasons are valid for not looking at one of the most important emphasis in Jesus' ministry. And an interesting correlation to that is this. Jesus asked every one of us to be involved in his ministry of healing. In fact, we know that one of the spiritual gifts, and when you come to faith, whether it's through baptism or through hearing the gospel, each one of you was given at least one spiritual gift. And one of that list of gifts is the gift of healing. That's where you will pray for a person's healing, and God will sometimes miraculously, through his own intervention, heal someone of their diseases. It's not you. It's simply a gift that you've been given by God through which he works. But today what I'd like to do is to focus on all the reasons why God heals. Because it's simple. It's to connect people to Jesus. Now to talk in detail how God heals physically, emotionally, and spiritually is a lot for one sermon. So what I thought I'd do today is to give five observations or five thoughts about how, how God works in our lives today and how he heals. First, everyone needs healing healing because we continuously sin. Now the Bible clearly teaches that sin is the cause of pain and diseases and chronic conditions that are due to sicknesses. As we explore the Bible, there's a close correlation between the two. Now some of our sicknesses or diseases that we get have been caused by our own actions. These could be physical, emotional, or spiritual illnesses. And a good example is substance abuse. Left unchecked, it can create ravages upon our body. Now, you'd think that Jesus might put self-inflicted, if you will, diseases on a lower priority of healing than he would someone that had no role in playing and catching a disease. But actually the opposite is true. In John chapter 8, Jesus forgives a woman, this time of a spiritual malady, for she was guilty of adultery. After forgiving her sins, Jesus simply said this, go now and leave your life of sin. In other words, healing comes by repentance, by faith, and by changing our ways if it's self-inflicted. Now, some sicknesses like addiction need extra help to get over from medical professionals or psychological professionals. And that's okay. Sometimes God heals us through human hands just as he heals us supernaturally, and especially through the wonderful body he has made for us. A second thought or reflection to consider when we talk about God's healing is that sometimes God uses other Christians through which he heals us. In John chapter 5, we're given clear instructions on help someone else who is sick. Beginning at verse 14, Paul writes this. If anyone among you is sick, 
let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make them well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That ministry of turning to others for healing is active at Epiphany. You can come talk to me or Deacon Bob. We have a wonderful prayer chain that grows in the number of people who are a part of it. You can submit a prayer request. And another way is a trusted, mature Christian friend. We serve one another in aiding people so that God can heal them to connect them to Jesus, the ultimate healer. Third observation from the Bible is this. Just because someone is sick does not mean they cause their illness. Now listen carefully. While all sin leads to sickness, either spiritual, emotional, or physically, not all sicknesses that an individual is suffering is the result of the sin that they have committed. For example, in John chapter 9, verses 2 to 3, Jesus has an encounter with a blind man who he heals. His disciples later asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Some of our illnesses, whether it be physical, emotional, or spiritual, are simply the result of living in a fallen world that's been devastated by sin. And for this type of illness, God is always there for us. And the pandemic is a perfect example. One of the awful consequences of this pandemic is the isolation that Christians feel if they have to go into the hospital right now. As we all know that visitors are extremely limited, including family members. If they go into ICU and they succumb to the coronavirus or COVID-19, you'll often hear a phrase, it's a tragedy that they had to die alone. But I want to direct your attention to today's gospel, to what Deacon Bob read in verse 31. We read five simple words regarding Jesus and Peter's mother-in-law who was sick. The Bible says, so he went to her. Jesus went to the sick woman. That means that Jesus arose from the dead and he's present everywhere today, even in here. A Christian, you and me, are never alone. The Holy Spirit dwells in our souls, in our bodies, whether we're sitting in a green chair here or we're lying in a bed in ICU, cut off from our relatives and our loved ones. The holy angels of God are tasked with aiding and protecting us. And all the while, God the Father from all eternity watches over us, ensuring that his perfect plan for our lives is done. And all of this through the grace and mercy of Christ won for us on the cross. So whether our sickness is caused by sin that we committed or is simply the result of living in a fallen creation affected by sin, God never abandons us in our hour of need. A fourth observation is that sometimes sickness is caused by the sins of other people and we end up being the victims. I'll give you some examples. Emotional, physical, or sexual abuse. All three can do heavy damage to the body and heavy damage to our psychological well-being. God gives us medical and psychological professionals to attend to us, to aid in our healing. But as you well know, the physical scars of the result of abuse can heal. 
but oftentimes the most difficult ones are the psychological wounds. Sometimes victims are filled with justified anger. They were the innocent victims at the hands of another sinful, evil person. But sometimes that anger prevents them from healing. They hold grudges. They vow to get even. They vow never to forgive. And unfortunately, that blocks off those tender emotions and psyche that need God's healing. In Mark chapter 11, 25, Jesus says something that for a victim of emotional, physical, or sexual abuse seems cruel. But there's a reason behind it. Let me read the passage first, Mark eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus says, what, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you of your trespasses. Where sometimes people get stuck when they are righteously angry, when they've been a victim, but they start obsessing over it is that they don't understand that forgiveness never absolves a sinner of what they've done wrong. Only God can do that. But it does free the victim from the emotional damage that's been afflicted upon them. God's word is living and it brings healing when we follow it and the Holy Spirit works through it. A fifth and final observation is how God heals us spiritually. In Luke chapter 5 and Mark 2, we find the account of Jesus healing a man with paralysis. That's the account where they lowered, his friends did, him on a stretcher through the roof because the room was so crowded with people who sought healing from Jesus. Jesus healed the paralytic first of his physical suffering, And then he healed him spiritually. He said, your sins are forgiven. Now, for once, the Pharisees who observed this asked a question that was certainly warranted. They pointed out to Jesus that only God can forgive sins. To which Jesus responded, what is harder to forgive sins or to heal? Translation for us today, I am the living God who heals physically and spiritually. 1 Peter 2.24, Paul writes about Jesus. He himself bore our sins in his body on a tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. And then he quotes Isaiah. By his wounds you have been healed. Physical and emotional healing are high priorities for each of us, especially in our hour of need. But what we all need all the time is spiritual healing. And today, Jesus offers that healing for our souls that have been wounded by sin. Sin we've done, the sin of others. For Jesus tells us that when we receive Holy Communion today, he gives us exactly what we need to be healed. His words from the Gospels are this, given and shed for you, For the forgiveness of sins. Remember that Jesus healed people of their emotional sicknesses and their physical ones for one specific reason. To connect them with him so that they would have eternal life. Our final verse today is John 20, 30 through 31. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. All miracles point to Jesus. All healings point to Jesus so that we have a relationship with him. So without a doubt, God does heal us today, just as Jesus did in his earthly ministry. Sometimes physically from the sin we have committed or the sin of others or the sin of this world. God also heals us emotionally, offering us freedom. And he reminds us that by forgiving a perpetrator, 
We are the ones who are healed by God's living word. And to all, God offers spiritual healing through the death and resurrection of his son. But all healing has one purpose, to connect us and keep us with Jesus. Let's pray. Almighty God, we ask for your blessing of healing in our lives today. We thank you that you have preserved and protected us from death during this pandemic. For those of us who are dealing with emotional wounds today, especially if our hearts are angry and unforgiving, we ask that you would soften them through your word and give us clarity by the Holy Spirit's power to understand that the act of forgiveness releases us from our bondage. And for all of us, as we prepare to receive Holy Communion today, may we be mindful of the devastation that our personal sins do in our relationship with you. And even more so, may we be mindful that you heal us through Jesus Christ's real body and blood given to us through the bread and wine of Holy Communion. In his name we pray. Amen. And now I invite you to stand and let's profess our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And I invite you to be seated. I'm sorry, we're going to do aerobics. I invite you to continue standing. <laughs> Let us pray for all people of God and for all people in their need, for the church of God everywhere that the Lord Jesus would continue to work among his people to forgive sins, deliver from death and the devil, and strengthen and preserve them in one true faith unto everlasting, and that his people always remember why he has come as Savior from sin. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the kingdoms of this world, that God would guide rulers to act with justice and integrity in service to all who is entrusted in their care, and that when surrounded by violence and uncertainty, his people might trust in his unsearchable wisdom and cling to his promises of rescue in Christ Jesus. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who grieve and those in need of deliverance and of, from illness, we especially pray for Walt Wilson, Bill Berger, and Tyrone Helen that God would heal the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds, would grant them relief and preserve in, in the hope of his steadfast love in Christ Jesus. For those who suffer from chronic illness and long-term suffering, that as Christ healed his mother-in-law of Simon Peter, God would give the power 
to the faint, increase the strength of those who have no might, and preserve them in patience and in faith, that in Christ they would mount up with wings like eagles, run and not be weary, and walk and not faint. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he is betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And may the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Thank you. And you may be seated.
I invite you to stand. And now may the very body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. And let us pray together. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.